This is module three of DLS 105, Risk Tools and Calculations for Risk Assessments, Uncertainty Evaluation and Portrayal. There will always be uncertainty in risk analysis and in the decision-making process. Evaluating and communicating uncertainty is important for all levels of risk assessment. The objective of this module is to define and to apply the basic principles of uncertainty evaluation, including Monte Carlo analysis, Latin hypercube sampling, using at risk, and the first order second moment method. In this presentation, I will start with the definition of uncertainty and its different types. I will cover the basic probability distributions that are most often used during dam and levee safety risk assessments, then move into Monte Carlo analysis and correlation. After that, we will move into the basics of using at risk, followed by the first order second moment method, before finishing up with some of the different ways we can portray uncertainty. Starting with the definition of uncertainty. Uncertainty is a lack of sureness or confidence in predictions, inferences, or conclusions due to imperfect knowledge. When we are dealing with uncertainty with respect to natural phenomena, that is known as aleatory uncertainty or natural variability. Uncertainty with respect to a belief is known as epistemic or knowledge uncertainty. Knowledge uncertainty is just like its name implies. It is the result of imperfect knowledge. Collecting more and better data might reduce it, and examples of which would be model uncertainty and parameter uncertainty. Sometimes more than others, we are unsure of our model's ability to adequately represent reality. And we also have uncertainty in the parameters we put into the model, which can be due to a limited amount of data or difficulties in measurement. Natural variability is the inherent randomness in a natural process or property. It can be better characterized and addressed quantitatively with more data, but in principle, it cannot be reduced or eliminated. In any practical risk analysis, how we classify and portray uncertainty as aleatory or epistemic is up to the modeler to decide and will generally be a property of the model rather than a property of the real world. We will model some uncertainties as if they were random, even though they really stem from a lack of knowledge, like soil properties, for example. We approach the data scatter as if it was the result of a random process just out of convenience so that we can make conclusions based on its variation and engineering implications. Theoretically, the data we are after can be observed and measured if enough time and money are spent on investigation and testing, but rarely do we have that kind of time and funding, so it is often not practical. Here are some different sources of uncertainty adapted from Tung and Yin, categorized as either natural variability or knowledge uncertainty. Please keep in mind that some things in risk analysis can have uncertainty that falls under both categories, like a stage frequency curve. There is natural variability in the flood inflow, but also knowledge uncertainty in many of the parameters that enter the model, like runoff coefficients and loss rates. Besides being required by policy, we quantify uncertainty to evaluate problems more thoroughly and to try to anticipate the unexpected. It gives decision makers more information and a better understanding of what the risk assessment team thinks they know and what they know they do not know. Along with an analysis of sensitivity, it can be used to inform additional studies and to help make the case for future investigations and data gathering efforts. Another reason is the shortcomings of only considering the averages. While the mean or expected value risk is used as a primary means of managing the dam and levee safety portfolios, there's more to it than that. Understanding the basis for the risk estimate is as important as the risk estimates themselves. For example, when evaluating two modification alternatives, the mean risk reduction may be similar, but one may be more reliable and more certain to be effective. The other may be very difficult to construct properly. This is why decisions are made based on all relevant information, not just the mean estimates. When making a decision about future actions, we need to think about the factors that most greatly impact the risk, how sensitive the risk is to these factors, the cost of taking additional action, either through investigation or modification, and what potential exists for reducing uncertainty. There are going to be times when further study is going to be very helpful 
and there are going to be times when further study will not help us at all. By considering the possibilities and the most critical factors, we can better predict which it's going to be and choose the appropriate course of action. Keep in mind that communication of uncertainty has as much value to decision makers as the quantitative estimate itself, if not more, but the case and the numbers must be consistent. Now that we have a consistent understanding of what uncertainty is and why we try to quantify it, how exactly do we go about modeling it? A good place to start is with probability distributions, which are used to describe the possible outcomes or possible values associated with a random variable. Probability distributions are generally divided into three different types. Discrete distributions describe cases in which a random variable can only have separate and discrete values, values that are countable, like the probability distribution of a coin flip, heads or tails, or the roll of a die, one through six. Continuous distributions describe cases in which the random variable can have any value within a certain range, like those that describe our no-rule probability estimates. Mixed distributions, as the name implies, are part discrete and part continuous. First, some rules. A valid probability distribution must be defined for all values that variable can take on. The probabilities must be greater than or equal to zero. They obviously cannot be negative. The sum of all the probabilities must be equal to one. So if you think back to module one, these two requirements are the first two axioms of probability. All probabilities are positive real numbers, and the combined probability of the outcomes must equal one. Here's an example of a discrete probability distribution shown in a couple different forms. The top plot is a probability mass function, and it gives a probability that a discrete random variable is exactly equal to some value. The bottom plot is a cumulative form of the distribution. We can use these plots to obtain the probabilities for the conditions in the bulleted list to the left. The first three are easy to read off the probability mass function. The probability that x is equal to 0 is equal to 0.1. The probability that x is greater than 4 in this instance can only be when x equals 5, so it is also 0.1. And the probability that x is greater than or equal to 4 is equal to the probability that x equals 4 plus the probability that x equals 5. So it is 0.1 plus 0.1, which equals 0.2. From the cumulative plot, we can easily read off the probability of x being less than or equal to 2. The cumulative probability at 2 is equal to 0.6, so the probability of x being less than or equal to 2 is also 0.6. The probability that x is greater than 0, but less than or equal to 4, is equal to the cumulative probability up to and including x equals 4, which is 0.9, minus the 0.1 probability at x equals 0. So we get 0.9 minus 0.1, which is 0.8. Then for the last one, the cumulative probability up to and including x equals 4 is 0.9. An example of a discrete probability distribution would be the number of gate failures. You cannot have 0.3 gate failures because a gate either fails or does not, so it must be a whole number. Discrete distributions are defined by x values that are countable. On to continuous distributions. The probability plot at the top is a probability density function, or PDF, and the area under the curve is equal to 1. The probability density function shows the relative frequency of the values that the probability distribution can take on. The cumulative distribution function, or CDF, at the bottom is the integral of the probability density function and gives the cumulative probability associated with a function. All CDF start at a probability of 0 and end at a probability of 1. In this plot, the x that has a 0.5 probability of being exceeded is the median. What this means is there's a 50% chance that a value sampled from the distribution will be less than or equal to that value. The mode is the number that shows up most often and occurs at the highest peak of the PDF. The mean is the expected value or the centroid of the distribution. The best estimate in a risk analysis should always be the mean estimate. Keep in mind, because the PDF is symmetrical like shown here, 
the mean, median, and the mode will be equal. This is only because it is symmetrical. Later, there'll be another slide where I'll show a distribution for when these parameters are different because the distribution is skewed to one side. An example of a CDF or non-exceedance distribution is a gradation curve. The particle size of a soil is plotted against the percent finer by weight. For the same probability density function, an exceedance distribution or a complementary cumulative probability distribution function can be developed. Its equation is 1 minus the CDF, 1 minus the integral that's shown here on the slide. Flood and seismic hazard curves are both examples of an exceedance distribution. Here is an example of a stage frequency curve. If you rotate it clockwise, making the x-axis the new y-axis, its shape matches that of the complementary cumulative distribution function plot on the previous slide. The big FN chart is very close to being a CCDF, but it is not. The reason it is not is because we are plotting the cumulative probability f of being greater than or equal to life loss n, not the probability of f being greater than n. Therefore, it is not a true CCDF. It is probably better described as a mixed distribution, which I'll talk about next, since there's a discrete probability of zero life loss, not plotted because of the log scale, and a continuous probability of life loss greater than zero. Here is an example of a mixed distribution. It is discrete for where x equals zero and is continuous for where x is greater than zero. The plot at the bottom shows the complementary CDF for the probability distribution. Some examples of a mixed distribution would be snow water equivalent on a given day, the natural variability of the snow water equivalent, the flood frequency for an ephemeral stream, and debris plugging. The mean, as shown here, is the mean of the continuous part of the distribution, not the mean of the full mixed distribution. It is the mean when x is greater than zero. We can also have a joint or bivariate distribution that is a function of more than one variable. Joint distributions can be either discrete or continuous. An example of such a distribution would be a system response for an earthquake failure mode which would be a continuous function of PGA and pool. So for this figure shown here, is it a valid probability distribution? To be a valid probability distribution, the probabilities must be greater than or equal to zero, which they are, and the probabilities must all sum to be one, which they do. So it is a valid probability distribution. We can then use it to get the probability of X and Y combinations at the bottom left. In terms of specific probability distributions, there are a fair number of them that are available to help us describe random variables. Some of the more common types that may be helpful during a risk assessment have been highlighted here. Triangular, uniform, normal, log normal, PERT, and Weibull. Other distributions are available as well, such as the inverse Gaussian and beta general distributions, and they may be appropriate for specific applications. On the subsequent slides, the blue text gives the syntax for defining the distribution functions using the Excel add-on at risk. Once I have introduced some of the more common distributions and a couple other topics, we will get into the basics of using at risk. The normal distribution is a two-parameter continuous distribution defined by a mean and a variance or the standard deviation. The variance measures how far a set of numbers is spread out from their average value, and the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. The PDF in its equation is shown on the left, and the CDF with its equation is shown on the right. This will be the format for the other distributions as well. I've also provided the equations for the mean, the standard deviation, and the coefficient of variation. In a normal distribution, the mean will be equal to the median and the mode, since a normal distribution is always symmetrical. Many things in nature and engineering are normally distributed, especially in geotechnical engineering, such as the coefficient of permeability, cohesion and phi angle, 
SBTs, and other things. Because the random variable can take on any value between negative infinity and infinity, we can say that this type of distribution is unbounded. This figure shows the area under a normal distribution curve that corresponds to two, four, five, and six standard deviations. Two standard deviations covers approximately 68% of the area beneath the curve. Four standard deviations covers about 95% of the area under the curve. Five standard deviations is over 98%, and six standard deviations is 99.7%. There are a set of rules that can be used to estimate the standard deviation. The rules are based on our confidence in estimating the upper and lower limits of the data range that represents the random variable. If there is 100% confidence in estimating the upper and lower limits of the random variable, use the Six Sigma rule to estimate the standard deviation. We would take the largest value, subtract from it the smallest value, and then divide by 6. If there is a 99% confidence in estimating the upper and lower limits of the random variable, we could use the Five Sigma rule. Likewise, for 95% confidence in estimating the range of the random variable, use the Four Sigma rule. The log normal distribution is a continuous distribution for a random variable whose logarithm is normally distributed. If random variable x is log normally distributed, then the natural log of x is normally distributed. The log normal distribution is valid for x greater than zero and cannot be negative. Statisticians typically use the natural log ln and engineers sometimes use log base 10. For example, flood hazard always uses log base 10. The concept are the same, but the math and the equations are a little bit different. It's very important to always document and keep track of which base is being used. The equations on this slide are shown for the natural log. Log normal distributions are used with reliability analyses. We will step through how to do one of those a little later in the presentation. The PDF of a factor of safety can be represented by a log normal PDF. In the figure on the right, the hatched area under the curve and to the left of a factor of safety of one gives the probability that the factor of safety is less than one. This is also known as the probability of unsatisfactory performance. When the log normal distribution is transformed to the normal distribution by taking the natural log of the factor of safety, it is noted that the ln of one is equal to zero. Thus, the probability of unsatisfactory performance is represented by the hatched area under the normal distribution curve that is left of zero, so anywhere that it is negative. The log normal distribution is favorable for factor of safety for several reasons. First, a log normal function will never be negative, just like the factor of safety will never be negative. Second, the product of several variables will be log normally distributed, which will lead us into the next slide. Physical quantities that result from a summation of many independent processes have distributions that are approximately normal. Physical quantities that result from a product of many independent processes have distributions that are approximately log normal. These next few distributions will be very helpful to use during team elicitations when estimating nodal probabilities. The first one we have here is the uniform distribution, which is a bound distribution defined by an upper bound and a lower bound. It describes a range of values where each value is equally probable. Said another way, the uniform distribution will uniformly sample between the specified upper and lower bounds. This is a good distribution to use when you have a good idea of the possible range, but are very uncertain about where within the range of value is most likely to fall. The mean of the distribution will simply be the average of the upper and lower bounds. A triangular distribution is defined by a lower bound, an upper bound, and a most likely value. For this distribution, the mean is equally sensitive to each parameter and will be equal to the average of those three values. This distribution has no theoretical basis, but it derives its statistical properties from its geometry. It is popular during team elicitations because of its simplicity and versatility, 
along with the intuitive nature of its defining parameters. It should be noted that the triangle shape will usually overemphasize the tails and underemphasize the shoulders of the distribution in comparison with other more natural distributions, which I'll demonstrate a few slides from now. A best estimate probability should never be taken as the most likely value of a triangular distribution. It should be the mean. The mode and the mean will only be equal in the special case where the triangle is symmetrical. Similar to the triangular distribution, but with a more curved and natural shape, is the PERT distribution. The mean for the PERT distribution is four times more sensitive to the most likely value than to the minimum and maximum values. The PERT distribution came out of the need to describe the uncertainty in tasks during the development of the Polaris missile. The project had thousands of tasks, and estimates needed to be made that were intuitive, quick, and consistent in approach. The four-parameter beta distribution was used, and they made the decision to constrain the distribution so that its mean would be equal to the min plus four times the mode plus the max, all divided by six. This was an approximation to their decision that the distribution should have a standard deviation of one sixth its range, which would be the Six Sigma rule that we talked about earlier. So when estimating for a PERT distribution, you'll wanna take care to estimate the largest and smallest possible values. Assuming that many real world phenomena are normally distributed, one advantage of the PERT distribution is that it produces a curve similar to the normal curve in shape, which can be generated without knowing the precise parameters of the related normal curve, so it can make the estimation process a bit easier. Lastly, similar to the triangular distribution, the mode will not be equal to the mean except in special cases. Comparing the triangular and PERT distributions, for a triangular distribution, the mean is equally sensitive to each parameter and will give more weight to the tails of the distribution and less weight to the shoulders in comparison to the more natural distributions. There is less potential for systematic bias problems for the PERT distribution because the distribution puts more emphasis on the most likely value and relies less on the minimum and maximum. The mean will not be overinflated when the maximum of the distribution is very large. With regards to an elicitation, the more confidence you have in the most likely value, the more you may want to lean towards the PERT distribution, but you will want to take care to estimate the largest and smallest values possible. The less confident you are in the most likely value, the more you may want to consider a triangular distribution. Here's what I was getting at when I mentioned the tails and shoulders of the distributions. As you can see from the PERT distribution in red and the triangular distribution in green, the triangular distribution gives more weight to the upper end tail, while the PERT distribution gives more weight to the shoulders because it is weighted more towards the most likely value. This is not to say one distribution will always be better than the other. The point is to illustrate the differences between these distributions so you can better understand what each does when you're choosing a distribution. Triangular and PERT distributions, along with the log normal distribution, can be skewed. When there is negative skew, the mode or most likely value will be greater than the mean, and when there is a positive skew, the mode will be less than the mean. When a distribution is symmetrical, the mode, median, and mean will all be equal. The mean is the centroid or center of mass of the distribution. So how do we choose a distribution? These five questions can be used as a guide. What distribution provides the best fit? What distribution should be expected? What distributions have fit well in similar situations? What do the elicitors think? Does it even matter? Let's expand a little bit on the second to last question about what elicitors think and talk briefly about subjective probability estimates. Most of you are probably familiar with the verbal probability mapping scheme that is presented in best practices. Something that is likely is assigned a probability of 0.9, something that is unlikely, a probability of 0.1, very unlikely, a probability of 0.01, and virtually impossible, a probability of 0.001. If we were to plot these probabilities on a number line using a linear scale, 
you can see how the lower probabilities of the table are clustered together on one side, and you can see how the higher probabilities are clustered on the other side. If you plot it on a log scale, you'll see how the lower end starts to spread out more, with very unlikely halfway between virtually impossible and unlikely. Then lastly, if we plot it on a probability scale, they are much more evenly spaced. How the elicitor pictures the scale can impact the distribution they should choose. Let's consider an example. The elicitor assumes a triangular distribution and estimates a lowest reasonable value of 0.001, or virtually impossible, a most likely value of 0.01, very unlikely, and a highest reasonable value of 0.1, unlikely. When plotted on a linear scale, the PDF will look like this. The distribution is skewed to the left, and the mean will be almost four times higher than the mode. You can see how the higher probabilities represent a greater area of the distribution, which means they will be sampled more frequently. Was a skewed distribution really what the elicitor had in mind? If instead we use the log of the elicited probabilities to define the triangular distribution, it becomes symmetrical. Is this reasonable? Would the elicitors expect very unlikely to be exactly in the middle between virtually impossible and unlikely? They would if they were thinking in orders of magnitude. Maybe they were, maybe they were not. Because of the log transformation and the order of operations, despite having the appearance of a symmetrical distribution, the mean will not be equal to 0 0.01. It'll be close, but not quite. If we were to calculate the mean of the log of the probabilities, then it would be equal to 0 0.01, but we need to calculate the mean probability, which is a little different and a little higher. Lastly, here's what it would look like if we use the standard normal variate of the probabilities to define the distribution. This time, the distribution is skewed to the left, but only slightly, and gives a very similar appearance to the log triangular distribution. Is this what the elicitor had in mind? I doubt most people would think in terms of probability scale, but maybe. If we plot the distributions of each PDF together with the same scale, you can see the difference. You can see how the triangular distribution defined by the untransformed probabilities gives more weight to the higher probabilities and less weight to the lower values that we may be forced to consider when estimating probabilities. You will also notice that the mean is the highest for this distribution, the one shown in blue. The triangle distributions defined by the log of the probabilities and the standard normal variate of the probabilities result in very similar PDFs with the log version resulting in the lowest mean but only by a small amount. You will see the same thing when you plot the CDFs together. Remember, the most likely value was elicited to be 0 0.01. Using a triangular distribution, about 90% of the sampled values will be greater than the most likely value. Maybe that's representative of what the elicitors were thinking. Maybe it isn't. For the log triangular and z-triangular, that changes to roughly 50% and almost 60%. Maybe that's representative of what the elicitors were thinking. This is not to say that one distribution is better than the other, but the elicitors need to be aware of what the selected distribution looks like and what it is doing. The team needs to pick one that best represents their understanding of what they just elicited. Because of this, it's always a good idea to plot the distribution to make sure that it makes sense. Moving on and into confidence intervals. We can also describe the uncertainty associated with a random variable using confidence intervals. The confidence interval for a specified degree of confidence can be calculated as the area under the PDF for the interval multiplied by 100 to get it in the form of a percentage. Confidence intervals are typically reported based on equal tail probabilities. A confidence interval of 90% would typically be calculated based on an upper confidence limit of 95% and a lower confidence limit of 5%, or 95% minus 5% equals 90%. Here is an example of how we can use confidence intervals. We have the PDF and CDF for the fee angle of the soil 
and we want to report our confidence that the phi angle is between 30 and 33 degrees. The area under the PDF curve between a phi of 30 degrees and a phi of 33 degrees comes out to be 82%. But instead of integrating it, it is much easier to get this percentage using the CDF. We can subtract the cumulative probability of having a phi of 33 degrees, 84%, from the cumulative probability of having a phi of 30 degrees, 2% and get the same 82% confidence. One last slide on probability distributions. At risk can also be used to find parameters for a selected distribution that results in specified percentile values. We will use this when trying to fit distributions to the stage frequency relationships because RFA, at least for now, does not give us a CDF for each stage, just percentiles of the entire curve. For the syntax, you specify the percentile as a decimal, argument one type, argument two type, etc., followed by the value that corresponds to the target percentile. For example, if I wanted to define a triangular distribution with a fifth percentile of 0.15, a 50th percentile of 0.45, and a 95th percentile of 0.7, the formula would be as shown here in blue. As you can see from the CDF that overlies the PDF, everything works as intended. The 5th percentile is 0.15, the 50th percentile is 0.45, and the 95th percentile is 0.7. The next, the next topic is Monte Carlo analysis. Monte Carlo analysis is used to evaluate output uncertainty and when analytical solutions are difficult or do not exist. Basically, a CDF is developed for uncertain inputs, and each CDF is randomly sampled numerous times by randomly generating a number between 0 and 1, and then sampling the corresponding random variable. This is called inverse transform sampling. The output distribution is built up over multiple iterations or trials, and is repeated over and over again. With enough iterations, the output mean will converge, and we end up with a probability distribution of the model outputs. For a Monte Carlo analysis, each sample is entirely random and can fall anywhere within the range of the input distribution. It essentially samples a uniform distribution from 0 to 1, then transforms those values by pulling from the CDF. New samples are generated without taking into account previous samples. Sometimes consecutive samples will be close to each other, other times they will be far apart. For that reason, a large number of samples is necessary to adequately sample the tails of a given distribution using the Monte Carlo sampling method. Because we know the equations for the CDFs of several probability distributions, we can perform simple Monte Carlo analyses in Excel without using a program like at risk. This is the method that you'll find in many of the geotechnical toolboxes that are out on the RMC website. In this example, we're going to set up a triangular distribution in Excel. We will use the RAND function, a function that is built into Excel, to randomly return a number between 0 and 1. We will use these random numbers to sample from our distribution CDF by setting f of x equal to the random number, then solving the CDF equation for x. We will repeat this for however many iterations we want to do. Because the CDF equation for a triangular distribution is different on either side of the mode, we will need an if statement. In the first part of the if statement, we will check to see if the x is between a and b, the lower bound and the most likely value, or if it's between b and c, the most likely value and the maximum value. Once we figure out which side our x will be, we pick the proper equation and solve for x. The equation in the middle of the screen is for when x is between a and b, and the equation at the end is when x is between b and c. So f of x is equal to a random number between 0 and 1. We know what a, b, and c are, so we can solve for x with each iteration to sample our triangular distribution. In this example, we only did 10 iterations, which is woefully inadequate. We would do many more in practice, but once we have all our points, all our x values, 
we can then use them to develop a CDF. To develop a CDF, rank and sort the values from low to high. The cumulative probability for a given x value will be its rank divided by the number of iterations, and it will give the CDF shown here. If we were to up the number of iterations to 1000, the CDF looks much better. We get the nice S curve, and we do a pretty good job of estimating the median and the mean of the distribution. The tails of the distribution would be better represented if we did even more iterations. This brings us to our first exercise, where we will do a very simple Monte Carlo analysis using only Microsoft Excel. You are asked to generate the cumulative distribution function for A minus B and to calculate the mean of the distribution. We are told that A and B are both uniform distributions and to perform a thousand iterations, which the spreadsheet is conveniently set up to accommodate. Please pause the video and take the next few minutes to work through the exercise and then press play to resume the video when you are finished. From earlier in the presentation, we know that the function that defines the CDF for a uniform distribution is equal to x minus a divided by c minus a. For a given iteration, f of x is going to be equal to a random number between 0 and 1. We know that a in the equation is the minimum value and that c is the maximum value. So we can then solve for x, which will be the result of the distribution for the iteration. To start, we punch in the RAND function in cells C14 and E14. That's R-A-N-D followed by open and close parentheses, then hit enter. We can then drag the formula down in both columns to complete all the cells in the column. The RAND function will update every time a cell in the spreadsheet changes. This can be really annoying, so I copied each column and then pasted as values back into the same place so that they would not keep changing. Next, we will solve for x for distribution a. x is equal to f of x times c minus a plus a. f of x is the random number between 0 and 1, and we're multiplying that number by the maximum minus the minimum for distribution a then adding the minimum value from distribution A. I'll repeat that process for distribution B, solving for x from the same equation as before, but using different inputs. We'll use a different random number, and we'll use the minimum and maximum values for distribution B. x for A minus B will be equal to, you guessed it, A minus B for that iteration. Once those formulas are set, I can then drag them down to columns D, F, and G to complete the table for the remaining iterations. Next, we need to build the CDF for A minus B. To do this, copy the values in column G and paste as values into column J. Sort the values from smallest to largest. Each of these values will have a probability of 1 over 1,000 because there are 1,000 iterations and each iteration has the same probability of occurrence. So the cumulative probability will be the iteration number divided by 1,000, which is the number of iterations, B14 divided by 1,000. Then we will drag that formula down to the bottom to complete the table. Once completed, the CDF should look something like the curve on the right. For this analysis, the mean was equal to 69.9, but will be different for your analysis because a different set of random numbers will be generated. Had we done more iterations, the mean of everyone's analysis would have been much closer to the theoretical mean of 68.5. But a thousand iterations does a pretty good job and shouldn't be off by too much. A 
Another sampling method is Latin hypercube, which is the default method used by at risk. This method will recreate the input distribution with fewer samples than it will take for Monte Carlo sampling. Latin hypercube sampling divides the cumulative distribution function into equal intervals based on the number of iterations selected for the simulation. Let's say we wanted to do four iterations. This sampling method will split the CDF into four even intervals. Then a single sample is randomly selected from each of these intervals. As a result, even for a small number of iterations, the Latin hypercube method makes all or nearly all sample means fall within a small fraction of the standard error. So if we go back to the 10 iteration example we stepped through prior to the exercise and compare the results of Monte Carlo sampling versus Latin hypercube sampling, you can clearly see that Latin hypercube sampling does a much better job of matching the expected distribution with the limited number of iterations. One thing to be conscious of is what can result when samples are independent in a Monte Carlo or Latin hypercube analysis. If we are not careful, sometimes the distribution results can be physically impossible for things like system response probabilities or consequence relationships. So let's say I've used a distribution to define the system response at each stage. If samples are taken independently, the general shape of the system response curve is not maintained and is not monotonically increasing with stage for the iteration shown. The resulting curve increases, then decreases, then increases again, then decreases again. A system response curve cannot do that. One way around this is consistent percentile sampling. A percentile sampled and the corresponding system response probabilities for that percentile are selected for each stage. This can be accomplished simply in practice by correlating the system response probabilities versus stage. This way, the proper shape of the system response curve will be maintained with each iteration. Here is another example, this time for life loss consequences instead of the system response. You can see the results of independent sampling on the left and how consistent percentile sampling cleans things up on the right. This is what consistent percentile sampling would look like when sampling the stage frequency curve. You can see the general shape is maintained with each iteration. So what is correlation? Correlation is the degree to which two or more events are related. For correlated events, the occurrence of one event is an indication that the other event is also likely to occur, that would be positive correlation or dependence, or likely not to occur, which would be negative correlation or dependence. Correlation can be quantitatively accounted for in the risk analysis using correlation matrices, or more qualitatively accounted for by applying expert judgment to the estimated probabilities associated with the responses of groups of similar components. Let's do a quick quiz to help you understand correlation. Do the red and blue data sets show positive correlation, negative correlation, or no correlation? Starting with the first plot on the left. By inspection, you can see in some places the red increases while the blue decreases. And in other places, the red increases and the blue also increases. So there appears to be no correlation. In the second plot, the red increases while the blue decreases and vice versa. So they are negatively correlated. And in the last plot, both increase and decrease at the same time. So they're exhibiting positive correlation. In Dam and Levy risk analysis, what needs to be correlated? The probability of loadings that define a hazard curve should be correlated. Hazard curves are non-exceedance distributions, so the probabilities need to be continuously decreasing with stage and PGA. System response probabilities should be correlated with respect to loading to maintain their general shape. The same thing goes for consequence relationships. Although it is a simplification, we should correlate life loss between failure modes because how the public responds to a warning is likely going to be similar regardless of the failure mode. These first four items, what we are really doing is leveraging correlated sampling techniques to replicate the consistent percentile method. With regards to breach and non-breach life loss, assuming perfect correlation is a good practice, 
if the mobilization rate is driving the estimates. The idea is for a given scenario, if people are going to mobilize at a high rate for a non-breach warning, they would also mobilize at a high rate for a breach warning and vice versa. If, however, warning issuance is the driving factor, then it is reasonable to assume no correlation since the warning issuance time for breach and non-breach are not related. In reality, breach and non-breach life loss will not be perfectly correlated or perfectly uncorrelated, but these are good places to start. In the short term, there's been some talk about building the ability to calculate correlations between scenarios into the MMC toolbox, but the long-term goal is to build that feature into LifeSim. Here are two examples of life loss tornado plots that show life loss correlation to parameter uncertainty. For the scenario on the left, warning issuance and other factors are driving the life loss. So we probably do not want to correlate breach and non-breach life loss. For the scenario on the right, mobilization rate is clearly driving the life loss. So we'd want to correlate breach and non-breach life loss. We will talk more about tornado plots toward the end of this session. Circling back to the last full exercise we did, this slide shows how the CDF would change if we correlated distribution A and distribution B. The distributions were uncorrelated for the orange CDF and correlated for the blue CDF. To correlate the distributions in Excel, what you would do is use the same random number to sample distribution A and distribution B at a given iteration. That way, if it samples high for one, it will sample high for the other and vice versa. As you can see from the plot, correlation mostly reduces the variance in the output distribution because the correlation basically eliminates the chance of sampling high from distribution A and low from distribution B, and also the chance of sampling low from distribution A and high from distribution B. Even though the range in the outcome is smaller, the mean and median will be comparable whether the distributions are correlated or not. Moving on to the basics of using at risk. Before getting started building an at risk model, it is good practice to check your settings. For use ACE users, because ACIT will not let you automatically enable macros, you will need to disable multiple CPU support under the general tab if your spreadsheet has macros in it. This will obviously slow down the computation time, but will be the best you can do on a government computer unless you have an air gap machine that is off the network. On the sampling tab, you can choose between Latin Hypercube and Monte Carlo. Latin Hypercube is preferred and is the default. It is also a good idea to disable the Smart Sensitivity Analysis under the Sampling tab. Smart Sensitivity Analysis pre-scans inputs based on their precedent and formulas for outputs. Inputs that have no link to an output cell are removed from the Sensitivity Analysis. This is nice, but the Smart Sensitivity Analysis can add significant runtime for large models, so it is often best to disable it. On the tool ribbon, there is an icon of a red die. When the red die is checked, at risk will return on-screen random values within the limits of a distribution for each cell with an input distribution. The values will change every time the spreadsheet calculates. This feature can be very helpful when trying to see if the spreadsheet you are building is working correctly without running a full simulation by allowing you to step through some iterations. Just keep in mind that at risk ignores any correlation matrices at this stage. Correlation matrices are only recognized when you run a simulation. When the die is not checked, at risk will return the expected or mean value for the distribution unless you specify a specific static value. When working in a spreadsheet, especially one you are not familiar with, it is sometimes nice to know what cells have at-risk functions in them. You can do that by clicking the icon in the top right of the screen. By default, at-risk will shade the inputs blue, the outputs red, and the statistics functions green. You can change those default colors by going to Preferences and selecting Color Cells Preferences. Here are the basic steps to using at risk. First, we are going to build a spreadsheet model. Next, we are going to define our input distributions, correlations, and outputs. 
Remember that at risk will only store the simulation data for cells marked as an output. From there, choose the number of iterations. Then you are set to run the simulation and review the results. To add a distribution to a cell, click distribution from the at risk tool ribbon and find the one you want. The at risk dialog box will step you through what you need to define the distribution. The other way to add a distribution to Excel, if you know the function, is to just type it in. When I covered the different probability distributions earlier, those were the functions shown in blue at the top of the slides. If you want to correlate distributions, you will need a correlation matrix. To add one, highlight all the cells with the distributions that you want to correlate. Click correlation from the tool ribbon, and you should see the cells you highlighted listed in the dialog box that appears under Specify Inputs. Click OK and you can start building the correlation matrix. The matrix will be a table of values from negative 1 to 1. A value of 0 assigns no association between a pair of variables. A positive number indicates a positive association. As the value of one variable increases, so does the value of the other. A value of 1 represents a perfect positive correlation. A negative number indicates a negative association. As the value of one variable increases, the value of the other decreases. A value of negative 1 represents a perfect negative correlation. The cells located diagonally across the middle of the table will always be 1 because a cell must be perfectly correlated with itself. If you change a value on one side of the diagonal, the value that mirrors it on the other side will also change. In the red box is the correlation between the distribution in cell C6 and the one in D6. The same two cells are represented on the other side of the diagonal, so both cells outlined in red will always have the same value, as will the ones in blue and green. Again, the table values can be anywhere from negative 1 to 1, but for our purposes, they will usually all be ones because most frequently during risk calculations, we are correlating variables to ensure consistent percentile sampling. Once you have your correlation matrix filled out the way you want it, at risk will ask you where you want to put the matrix inside the spreadsheet. You can pretty much put it wherever you want. Just be sure there's enough room for it because it will overwrite your work if you put it in the wrong place. You can move the table after you place it, so it is good practice to select the cell at the bottom of the sheet where there's plenty of room. You can also change the correlation values in Excel at any time. When you place the matrix, at risk will create a named range and add some syntax to your formulas as shown. Be careful if you want to drag your formulas after setting up a correlation matrix. The number at the end is the distribution's position. It is a four for the fourth distribution, the cell highlighted in blue. This number would be a 1 for the distribution in column C, a 2 for the distribution in column D, and a 3 for the distribution in column E. Note that the number will not update if you drag formulas, so you will have to update them manually. At risk will run all the input distributions you create, but will only store the data for later use from cells marked as outputs. Highlight the cell you want to mark as an output, then click Output and choose Define. At risk will give you the option to name your distribution. You do not have to name each output cell, but it can be helpful later when reviewing the results. When you click OK, the output command will be added to the front of a formula and at risk will store the distribution of simulation results for that cell. After running a simulation, statistics can only be pulled from cells marked as outputs. You can define the number of iterations that will be run during a simulation from the tool ribbon. If you use Monte Carlo sampling, there are equations out there that will tell you how many iterations you need to achieve a certain level of confidence. But if you remember, at risk defaults to Latin hypercube sampling. With the Latin hypercube sampling method, a smaller number of iterations will be sufficient to produce means within the desired confidence interval. But there's no simple calculation to predict the necessary number. Without getting too far into it, 10,000 iterations will usually be plenty. 
After running a simulation, which is done by clicking the Simulate button in the middle of the tool ribbon, you can browse tables and plots of the results. Click the small icon from the tool ribbon that has what looks like a caption bubble with a red bar graph inside. You can then click around to the different cells and see the results of the distributions you just ran. In the default view, you will see a plot of the PDF and the simulation statistics but you can click on the plot options down at the bottom and can plot cumulative functions as well. Here is the CDF of the PDF we just saw. You can also call the statistics for an output cell using the functions provided in at risk. To call the mean of a distribution, the function is risk mean and the only input is the cell reference for the output cell for which you want the mean. You can call the value that corresponds to a specific percentile using risk percentile. The first input is the output cell reference, and the second input is the percentile you want it to return. This value needs to be in decimal form as shown, or input as a percentage. You can also call the value from a specific iteration using risk data. This is used when you want to make a scatter plot. The first input is the cell reference for the output cell. The second input is the iteration number you want to call. And the last input is the simulation number. Most of the time, you will only be running one simulation, so the last input is typically a one. You can also view all the at-risk simulation data in a single table. Click Explore in the tool ribbon, then choose Data under Simulation Details. If you click the footprint at the bottom of the table, the spreadsheet will update cells with the values from the selected iteration. It is a handy feature to understand the model when the results are not as expected or when troubleshooting an issue. There are also options for sorting the data if you click the gear icon next to the footprint. When saving a spreadsheet, you will be asked about saving at-risk simulation results and graphs. By clicking Yes, you will save the data to the workbook. When files get large, it is best to click Options and save the data as an external file. Be sure to save the data file in the same folder as your spreadsheet. This way, the next time you open it and have at-risk running, at-risk will ask you if you want to load your simulation data. You can also save and open simulation files from the Utilities menu of the Tool Ribbon. This brings us to our second exercise, where we will use at risk to set up some consequence distributions. The instructions tell us to define PERT distributions for the breach and non-breach life loss at each peak stage listed. We are told to assume perfect correlation between breach and non-breach life loss and to complete the incremental table at the bottom of the sheet. Please pause the video now and complete the exercise. To start, we will define a PERT distribution in cell F11. The function is risk PERT as shown in the formula bar. The first input is the minimum value, the second is the most likely value, and the third and final input is the maximum value. The formula will be the same for all the other stages, so we can drag the formula down to complete the breach life loss table. Next, we will do the same thing for the non-breach life loss. The function is risk pert and the inputs, in order, are the minimum, the most likely, and the maximum life loss values. Drag that formula down, and we are ready to build our correlation matrix. To correlate the breach and non-breach life loss, we will highlight the yellow cells in column F that hold the breach life loss distributions, and then, while pressing the control key, highlight the non-breach life loss distributions in column L. Click on the correlation button from the tool ribbon. The dialog box will ask you to specify the inputs. Because you have already highlighted them, you can just hit enter. 
In the next window, the correlation matrix will be displayed. You can edit it here if you want, but I find it to be quicker and easier to edit the table after it's added to the spreadsheet, so I will just click OK. A dialog box will ask you where you would like to place the correlation matrix. Select the yellow box under Correlation Matrix, then click OK. Here is the correlation matrix. For perfect correlation, all the zeros will need to be ones. We can override all the zeros one at a time by hand, or the easiest and most efficient thing to do is to highlight all the values in the table and hit Control F to pull up the Find command. Then you can find all the zeros and replace them with ones. Once complete, the correlation matrix should look like this, with all table inputs now set to 1. Now we are ready to scroll down to the bottom to fill out the incremental life loss table. The incremental life loss is equal to the breach life loss minus the non-breach life loss. This equation is what we will set up in the output cells. For a stage of 470.9, input the breach life loss from cell F11 and subtract the non-breach life loss from cell L11. Once we have that equation set, we need to mark the cell as an output so that at risk knows to store data for the cell once we run the simulation. Select cell C42, the cell we just populated, and then click output from the at risk tool ribbon. A dialog box will prompt you to name the output. You can name it if you like, or you can just click OK to leave it unnamed. The formula now starts with risk output and a set of parentheses plus the formula for incremental life loss we already input. If you name the output cell, the name in quotes would show up between the parentheses. To call the percentiles, the formula is risk percentile. The first input is the output cell, and the second input is the percentile in either decimal form or percentage form. For the fifth percentile, type in risk percentile, set the first input as cell C42, followed by 0.05 or 5%. Repeat for the 50th percentile and the 95th percentile, where the last input will be 0.5 or 50% and 0.95 or 95% respectively. Because we have not run the simulation yet, the value at risk returns will be the same as that shown in the output cell. They will change after we run the simulation. Next, we enter the formula for the mean. The function is risk mean, and the only input is the output cell C42. The last column asks for the results from the 20th iteration. We will use risk data to call the value. The formula is risk data followed by the output cell, the iteration number, which is 20, and then the simulation number, which is 1. With the formulas all set, we can drag them down to populate the rest of the table. We are now ready to check our settings and run the simulation. The settings are the way we want them with the iteration set to 10,000 and the sampling type set to Latin hypercube. Click OK to close the dialog box. Then click Simulate to run the analysis. It will take a few seconds, but when it is finished, you'll notice the percentile values and the means all changed. Your results should be very close to what you see on the screen, and they should not vary by more than a decimal point if everything was done correctly. Next, let's check our simulation data to make sure we called the 20th iteration properly. Click on Explore, then Data, which is down towards the bottom under Simulation Details. Scroll down through the data table until you get to the 20th iteration, and you'll see the data matches what we have in our table. You are not asked to do it, but to save the simulation results, click the Save icon in Excel, just like you normally would, and the following dialog box will pop up. The data from this simulation is small enough to save directly in the workbook, 
but I find that it is better practice to save the data as an external file by choosing the middle selection. So long as the simulation file is saved in the same folder with the spreadsheet, at risk will ask you if you want to open the simulation file the next time you open the spreadsheet. If you are not asked about opening the simulation file, you can click on Utilities and choose Open Simulation File to pull in the data. This is also where you would go to clear any simulation data should you want to remove it from a file. For situations where a probabilistic analysis is not feasible, such as those that require finite element modeling like a seepage analysis, reliability calculations like those done using the first order second moment method can provide a means of evaluating the combined effects of uncertainties and a means of distinguishing between conditions where uncertainties are particularly high or low. The method we're going to look at next is the first order because it uses a first order Taylor series approximation. It is second moment because it uses the standard deviation. Here are the steps of the first order second moment method. First, determine the most likely values of the parameters involved and compute the factor of safety by the normal deterministic method. We will then estimate the standard deviation of the parameters that involve uncertainty and then compute the factor of safety that results from increasing an uncertain parameter by one standard deviation from its most likely value and then by decreasing it by one standard deviation for its most likely value while holding all other values in the equation equal to their most likely value. We will then compute the change in factor of safety that results for each uncertain parameter. Next, we will compute the standard deviation and the coefficient of variation of the factor of safety and use those values to calculate the reliability index which will in turn be used to calculate the probability of unsatisfactory performance. For this method, all uncertain parameters, inputs and outputs, are assumed to have a normal distribution. Nog normal can also be assumed if the calculations are done with a log transform. Here are the equations used in the method. We have the standard deviation and the coefficient of variation of the factor of safety, the log normal reliability index, and the probability of unsatisfactory performance. This will all make much more sense when I step through an example in the next couple slides. Probability of unsatisfactory performance is used by the Corps of Engineers as opposed to failure just because when you're looking at limit states, the result may be some small movement as opposed to a catastrophic failure, so keep that in mind. Let's step through an example. This example comes directly from Dr. Duncan's paper and we're going to calculate the factor of safety against sliding. The factor of safety is going to be equal to the weight of the wall and backfill over the heel of the wall times the tangent of the friction angle between the base of the wall and the sand divided by the earth pressure force on the vertical plane through the heel of the wall. The first step is to calculate the most likely factor of safety and in this instance it is equal to 1.5. Next, we need to estimate the standard deviation of the parameters that involve uncertainty. The equivalent fluid unit weight, the tangent of the friction angle between the base of the wall and the sand, the backfill unit weight, and the concrete unit weight. To estimate the standard deviation, there are a handful of methods that are available. If we have enough data, we can compute it directly. We can reference published values if they are available. Or if we have a good idea of the range, we can use the Six Sigma rule. Once we have our standard deviations for each parameter, we're going to compute the change in the factor of safety that results from changing one input at a time by plus and minus one standard deviation while holding all other variables constant at their most likely value. As shown in the table, if I vary the equivalent fluid weight by one standard deviation while holding all other variables constant at their most likely value, the change in factor of safety is negative 0.38. I repeat this process varying only one parameter at a time until I have the factor of safety change associated with each variable. Once I have that, I can calculate the standard deviation of the factor of safety using the equation shown to the right, which equals 0.25. I can then divide that number by the most likely factor of safety to get the coefficient of variation of the factor of safety, which is equal to 17%. From there, we can calculate the log normal reliability index. 
I plug in the most likely factor of safety, 1.5, into the numerator, and the coefficient of variation of the factor of safety, the 0.17 value we just calculated, and I get a log normal reliability index of 2.32. To then calculate the probability of unsatisfactory performance, I use the norms dist function in Excel, and I get a probability of 0.01. This means the wall is approximately 99% reliable in regards to sliding. This brings us to our final exercise of the session, where we will work through a simple application of the first order second moment method. We are asked to calculate the probability of unsatisfactory performance for a downstream embankment slope. The factor of safety equation provided is b times the tangent of phi. We are told to use the Six Sigma rule to estimate the standard deviation for both b and phi and are given a minimum, maximum, and expected value for both parameters. Please pause the video and complete the exercise, then resume the video once you are complete. First, for this exercise, we need to calculate the standard deviation for b and phi using the Six Sigma rule. To do this, we subtract the minimum value from the maximum value and divide by 6. This gives us a standard deviation of 0 0.042 for b and 3.8 for phi. Next, we need to calculate the factor of safety using the most likely values and then vary one parameter at a time by plus and minus one standard deviation. For case one, we calculate the factor of safety using the most likely values of both parameters. For cases two and three, we will vary B by plus and minus one standard deviation. And then for cases four and five, we will vary phi by plus and minus one standard deviation. When we do this, we get the following factors of safety. Next, we calculate the change in the factor of safety that results from varying b, and then the factor of safety that results from varying phi. When we varied b in cases two and three, the factor of safety changed by 0 0.065. When we varied phi in cases four and five, the factor of safety varied 0.322. Next, we use the equations provided earlier to calculate the standard deviation and the coefficient of variation of the factor of safety, the log normal reliability index, and the probability of unsatisfactory performance. Starting with the standard deviation of the factor of safety, we plug into the equation on the screen and solve. We'll get a standard deviation of 0.164. We then divide that number by the most likely factor of safety, which is in cell E27. This gives us a coefficient of variation of the factor of safety of 0.14. We now have what we need to calculate the log normal reliability index. We plug in the most likely factor of safety and the coefficient of variation of the factor of safety into the equation on the screen. And we get a log normal reliability index of 1.069. We will then use the norm dist function in Excel to return the standard normal cumulative distribution function of the negative log normal reliability index. This results in a probability of unsatisfactory performance equal to 0.143. The final topic of this session is portraying uncertainty for dam and levy risk assessments. The first option is the scatter plot on the FN chart, where we are plotting the FN pairs from each iteration of the simulation. These points can be plotted semi-transparently, as shown in the example, to visually highlight the area where most of these pairs plot. Mean values are shown as the diamond for without intervention and the triangle for with intervention. It is also good practice to report the percentage of points that plot above the average annual life loss guideline and the annual probability of failure guideline. We can plot the PDF for the annual probability of failure or the average annual life loss. 
and we can plot the cumulative distribution function for both as well. The plot of the CDF is nice because you can read the percentiles directly from the plot. For the system response in the Big FN chart, we can report the mean in the percentiles. The Big FN chart, a curve is generated for each iteration. Each curve has equal weight. The mean is generated by taking all the points that define all the curves, dividing their probability by the number of iterations, and then combining them into one data set. This is why the mean starts outside the 95th percentile curve. It will always start at the highest life loss of all the runs. Since there's a lot of data, one way to reduce the number of points, but essentially get the same curve, is to create life loss bins and sum the probability of the ends that fall in that bin. You just need to make sure that you have enough bins to adequately define the curve. On the consequence side, box and whisker plots are often used to show the range in the estimated life loss. The ends of the box give the lower and upper quartile values, which is just a fancy way of saying the 25th and 75th percentiles. Where the box changes from blue to yellow in this example is the median or 50th percentile value. The whiskers that come off the ends extend to the minimum and maximum values. I haven't seen anyone do this just yet, but the annual probability of failure, the average annual life loss, the average annual economic cost, and the individual risk could all be portrayed using box and whisker plots. Tornado plots can be generated in at risk and are a good way to illustrate the key components that are driving the risk estimate. In this particular plot, at risk determines the amount of output variance attributed to each factor. The higher the contribution to the variance, the greater the impact on the output. This concludes session three of the course. Be sure to complete homework three to get credit for completing this session. In homework three, you're given a stage frequency relationship, nodal estimates, and life loss estimates for an overtopping failure mode. You're asked to generate the FN scatter plot. At risk will be needed to complete the assignment. Once complete, please send your completed homework to RMC training at usace.army.mil with the subject as DLS 105 homework three to help us keep track of the submittals. Thanks in advance for your cooperation. If you have trouble with the homework, please reach out to the instructors through the email address on the screen or by emailing us directly. We'll go over the solution to the homework assignment during the live question and answer portion, which will be in a few weeks. Also, at the end of the live session, you'll be asked to take a short quiz so we can give you credit for your participation. If you missed the live session, a recording will be posted to the website. The quiz will stay open until the day of the next live session. Please check the course schedule for dates and times. Thank you for your attention and we'll see you again in a few weeks.